What is up, Facebook land? Welcome to another episode of the Two Dates and a Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler. And before I introduce my man, Dutch Bradley, um, I'm going to first do a dedication, as I always do before every single episode. Um, today, I'm going to I'm going to dedicate this episode to um, firefighters, EMS, people that, that are running into the danger um, alongside police officers. Um, I, I've done law enforcement dedications before, but I've never done one for uh, those in emergency services. Um, I have a lot of family and friends that have been working the fire and, and, and EMT paramedics. Um, and what they do sometimes goes un, unseen. Sometimes it's uh, behind the scenes. Um, I know the day when I had to deliver a baby, that the best sound I ever heard was when that ambulance pulled up and I had half a baby out and I just had somebody to hand it to that knew what the hell they were doing. So um, I was very thankful that day for those EMTs. So for everybody that is uh, volunteering, especially in America, most of our firefighters are volunteers. Um, but those that are volunteering, those are paid, those are working the night shift uh, as firefighters or EMTs. Thank you for what you do. Um, the podcast, you can find it everywhere. Uh, iTunes, Applecast, Podcast, uh, Stitcher, CastBox, Anchor, anywhere you find a podcast, you can find mine. Um, now, my man Dutch. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because he's got a very long resume, but let me tell you this. His life story should be a movie. It is amazing to hear. I can't wait to get deep into it. But Dutch is, uh, he's originally from the Lewisburg, Pennsylvania area. So if anybody knows Bucknell or Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary, we'll try to skip that one. Um, <laughs> from that area, he is, uh, he's got a life that I'm not going to give too much away, but he had a little bit of a checkered lifestyle that he came out the other side on. He became a man of faith. Um, he was a bodyguard for uh, some very famous people. Um, and now he's just going around sharing his story with, with anybody who's willing to listen, schools, prisons. Uh, he's really big into prison reform right now. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my man, Dutch Bradley. Hey, hey, thanks for having me on your show, Matt. Two dates and a dash. Tell us, there tell it is. us what is that? Tell us what is two dates and a dash? You, you get two dates in your life, the one you're born, the one you die. And what the dash is what you do with your life. Yeah, and uh, the only thing in your control is that dash. Yeah, and uh, oh. so I, I, the show is is basically to highlight people that are living this shit out of their dash. Yeah, and that that's yeah. on whatever level. Um, yeah. and and I think it's uh, it's been fun. I'm having a blast. And the fact that you're on the show is even better. I love being here, man. It's been great just connecting with you, bro. So I'm a Philly guy at heart. I love that you got my Eagles jersey posted up there in the background. As long as you keep that up, man, we are good to go. So I want to give a quick shout out to your boys, Dave and Joe Rogers. Yes. So, uh, Dave, Dave's the one that uh, made this introduction. Um, you Park. guys played ball back in the day. Washies Park, Danville, PA. I used to, I used to tear them up, Matt. Don't let them tell you no different. I take it to the hole and slam right on them. Don't let them tell you no different, bro. I can tell you Dave Rogers never met a three-point shot he didn't like. Oh, for sure. And he hit him. Oh, for sure. Yo, Joe was bad as well. So thank you to both the Rogers boys. So, all right, let's get to let's get this thing started. I'm going to ask you a softball question. And we're going to see where the hell this thing goes. Okay. Who is Dutch Bradley? Oh man. Oh wow. Uh, I think above and beyond anything else, I'd like to be known as a man who has been changed by faith in God through Jesus Christ. Uh, that's been the most powerful thing in my life. Right behind that would be, I strive to be the best father that I can be. Uh, I'm really hardcore about men coming home to their children, being good husbands for their wives and being a part of their family. So that's really big for me. And I'm somebody who has just overcome a lot of hurdles in life because I made some bad decisions early in life and uh you know even to this day i still have to jump those hurdles and i have to sprint in between every one so it's just like your show it's two dates and a dash i am on the dash and every day i have to wake up and encourage myself never to quit never to stop keep running because other people's lives may depend on it that's a great explanation i love it um you know one of the things that really struck me was that you owned your mistakes for sure. So um, we haven't talked about any of my mistakes, but I, I think the importance of owning them is 
that I had to learn how to do that. I think like most uh, children, young people, I was always looking to scapegoat bad decisions. It was always because of this. It was always because of that. It was because I didn't know my real father. It was because uh, I, my coach didn't like me. It was, you know, you have all of these different factors. But truth be told, um, I learned after I hit really probably rock bottom in my life. And my faith played a huge part in that was that I had to own it if I wanted to be forgiven of it. And that for me was life changing because that forgiveness piece for me is still to this day, uh, the piece that enables me to pick myself up, clean myself off, wash my face, take a bite of food and go out and attack life again uh, so that I'm not weighted down by the decisions of yesterday, but I can make new decisions to change my path today. Dude, you're, you're good at what you do. I'm not gonna lie to you, you're good at what you do. Man. <laughs> So let's let's go back and let's it's just a little history lesson for people and take you on a path of, of Dutch's life. And, you know, like I mentioned, you grew up in Lewisburg, PA. Um, you mentioned you didn't know your father. Um, yeah. Let's let's go from, say, high school. High school on. Let's let's talk about who you were in high school. Apparently you were a pretty damn good ball player. So you're saying you're dunking on everybody. So let's, <laughs> let's talk about who you were back then. Yeah, well, that was a nine-foot hoop at Washings Park. So just, <laughs> uh, you know, just to, just to put things uh, in order, I grew up in South Jersey. So my family had a trucking business off Oregon Avenue in South Philly. I lived in South Jersey till I was 10 years old. At 10, we then moved to Milton, Pennsylvania, which is right. It's a border town of Lewisburg. Uh, my older brother actually went to Bucknell. It's interesting that you mentioned them. Um, and then my senior year of high school, I left and I went to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, which is the home of the Little League World Series. So the problems that I ran into was that I always had antagonistic relationships with men. So because I didn't have a relationship with my biological father and I had a bad relationship with my stepfather, I looked for coaches probably to step up and fill that gap, but I never had a good relationship with them uh, because in my opinion, and they may offer you a different opinion, they didn't focus on building a relationship with me. They focused on utilizing my gifts and my abilities and my talent and how that could help benefit them in their sports teams. So by the time I end up a junior in high school, man, I'm just over my coaches at this point. I end up making a decision to switch high schools, but that breaks the rules in Pennsylvania for switching high schools because I did it for athletic reasons. So I end up in Harrisburg. I sit in front of a, a, a courtroom of seven judges. They end up making a ruling on my case and four to three, they determine that I moved for athletic reasons and that I could not play my senior year of, of sports. So that meant that football, which I lived for, I could not play. Basketball, I lived for, I could not play. I ended up appealing it. They overturned the appeal halfway through the basketball season. I break my shooting hand. So now I overcome the appeal and I have to play with a, uh, there's a cast on my arm. I cut the cast off and I just padded it with football pads and ended up playing the rest of my senior year. I think I ended up with a little over 1,200 points, but this was the last year before the three-point line. So 1,200 points at that time was pretty significant. And uh, so I was a great athlete, but like many athletes, especially those that play pro, when you're really celebrated uh, at the top of your school, and we were at the largest school in Pennsylvania or the largest uh, 4A bracket, once that is gone, you no longer have your identity. And I was struck with now nobody's clapping for me anymore. And nobody's telling me how good I played last night. No one's putting me in the newspaper anymore. And so with that loss of identity, I began making a series of just bad decisions. And um, I ended up getting involved in selling narcotics, cocaine to be particular, uh, and then later crack cocaine. And then I went from small doses to larger doses and in that process my girlfriend becomes pregnant and i don't know what to do 
I, I'm, I'm just lost. I don't have a father figure. I don't even have a coach that I can go to. And so I feel pretty lame duck. And when my son is born, I make him some promises. I say, son, I'll never leave you. I will always love you because I wish that my dad would have made that promise to me. The problem was I ended up getting arrested three times in two different states within three months. And now I'm sitting and looking at 38 years in prison for trafficking narcotics and guns. And I don't know what to do and I don't know how I'm going to get out. So that was pretty much rock bottom for me, Matt. Some things when I, you know, I, like I said, I don't ask, I don't write any questions down. I have no idea what you're going to say or where this conversation is going to go. But what really just struck a chord with me, and it's um, for me personally, it I, I sensed some guilt and some desperation out of you when you said that you made a promise to your son mm. that you would never leave him and you always love him. Was there a moment? where you thought to yourself, what the fuck did I just do? I made a promise I can't keep. And I wasn't, and, and quite frankly, you weren't doing anything to really ensure that you kept that promise, For right? Sure. You were you putting yourself in a position where, where the odds were that you were going to leave him, whether it was in prison or, or six feet under. How did you feel in your soul? Like, what was your, what, what was the guilt level like knowing that you, you didn't, you didn't fulfill that promise to your newborn son? Yeah, so it's interesting because at this time in my life, like many guys who are, who've had tough lives and have experienced rejection, I mean, that's what I was dealing with. I just felt completely rejected. Everyone that I had desired that would love me and step up and say, hey, let me help you get to college. You're a great athlete. Let's get you into a good program. No one did any of those things because I was under this suspicion of switching schools and going through this whole court process. So my coaches were hands off at this point, but here I am a young man in distress. I'm living by myself. My mother lives 40 miles away. I was emancipated in the courts. So there's, there's a lot of details, things that happen and no one took the time to care about me. That's how I feel. Mm -hmm. All they cared about was how I could help them go to a state championship or a state finals. And so when you look at it like that and you just you you feel the rejection that comes from men, here I am now with my son making him promises that I never insured. I, I've never even take the, taken the precaution to make sure that I could be there for him. I'm living recklessly. I mean, listen, Matt, I was at a place in my life where Scarface was my Bible, right? Anybody that knows the movie Scarface, I mean, The Godfather and Scarface, they were the they were the Old Testament and the New Testament in my life. They were the covenants that I had in life. And so I was going into Harlem, New York, into the roughest areas of Harlem, 171st and Amsterdam. I'm the only gringo on the block, bro. I'm the only white guy going in here. And I could remember the guys on the top of the buildings would begin whistling, white boy on the block, white boy on the block. I'd go all the way through go up into a high rise where four men with Uzis and machine guns would shake me down put me on an elevator. I'm 19 years old. Take me to the top floor where I would drop off a bag full of money and they would load me up with a bag full of cocaine. I'd then take that to the hotel. I would chop it up and I would saran wrap it around my legs and my torso. Then I would put on a double breasted suit, you know, that nice Italian double breasted like they wore the gangster flicks, put on a silk tie, slick my hair back, grab my briefcase, and I would literally get on commercial airliners with cocaine strapped on my body. And now this is before all the TSA stuff jumped off, but I would fly from an airport in New York or Newark, New Jersey, down to Atlanta, Georgia. And I had a little dope entrepreneurial business where I was dropping cocaine off all the way back up the coast. And I said to myself that I was doing this to secure my relationship with my son. But in essence, we know that that's not true because there's too much risk for me to make that kind of a promise. Long story short, when I finally get arrested, and I was arrested a total of nine times, but the last three were in succession. They were the most severe cases that I was facing. And it was on the floor of a prison. I had just gotten into a fist fight with another inmate. Because you have to understand, like, I'm the white guy that goes into Harlem, New York, and I'm not afraid. For me, it was a rite of passage. And for many of our young guys out here, they go into these dangerous areas 
It is a rite of passage and a way to prove their manhood. And so when I'm in prison, I get into a fist fight with another inmate. They separate us and they send us to lock up, but they give me the option if I want to go to church. I said, man, I don't want to go to no effing church. And I started to turn around and go back to my cell. They said, well, pack your bags. You're going to lock up. I took about a half a second to think. And I said, man, hold the door. I'm going to church, man. I don't want to go to no lock up. Now, I had never been to church before. What is that? I have no clue. That's the building on the corner that I never went into. Here's what was interesting. They put me in a six by four prison cell. And there was another guy in there. He was African-American. He was about 35. I was 22. As we sit there, you know, we're not making eye contact because you just don't do that without stuff jumping off. But another guy turns the corner from the outside. He's got on a button up shirt. He's got his little pen holder in his pocket. He's half, you know, he's got the, uh, the white walls on the side of his hair here. And he comes shuffling through and he reaches through the bars, hands me a small brown book. You guys may know it as a Gideon Bible. He reaches through, gives it to me. I look through it, but bro, I'm like, I'm not interested in this, man. I'm looking at 38 years and my son is going to hate me the same way I hate my father because he didn't love me enough to be there for me. And my son's going to think that I don't love him because he's never going to see me and he's never going to know me. Here, here's the reason why I share that. The man from the outside that shuffled in and handed me that brown book began quoting a bunch of scripture to me. I said, man, I'm not trying to hear that. He then looked at me on the floor and he said eight words that changed my life, Matt. He said, you look burdened. Can I pray for you? Now understand this. I don't understand prayer, nor do I even care for prayer. What I cared about was if you pray and it helps me, that may enable me to go back and at least see my son. My son was the motivating factor for me because I wouldn't have humbled myself to do it any other way. If it was just on me, I would have wrote it out because I was taught how to be hard. My heart was hardened and I would have just gone solo and I would have roughed my sentence out. But because of my son, I knew I was living far beneath my ability and I wanted to change so that my little boy could know who his father is. And here was my prayer. When I pray, God, let me just go home so I can see my little boy so that I can tell him how much I love him before I have to go away. So it goes to your point. I accepted responsibility for what I had done. I just wanted to say goodbye to my little boy before I had to go and do the time for it. So and that's such an amazing story. Um, I forgot I was hosting a show for a second. Uh, <laughs> Take me to the point where your motivation was to, to see your son before you went away. Obviously, you didn't go away for 38 years. Yeah. What was the sequence of events that happened that from that moment where those eight words were said to you to the moment where you were reunited with your son at home, a free man? What was so the succession of events that occurred that led up to that? It's a great question, and if, if I get, I don't want to get too long, so just give me a look or give me a point. You got four minutes. I can chop it up, but, you know, here's the way that it went, man. I went in after that prayer, and I called my son's mother, and I told her I just asked God for help, and I remember her reply. She said, you did what? Like, that just wasn't part of who I was, and I criticized her brother, who was my best friend, when he would write letters home from prison saying, God bless. Like, it just wasn't a part of our culture. Long story short, I got off the phone. I got in the chow line that night, and another guy cuts in front of me. And when he does, I pop him in the face with a cup of juice, and I ball up my fist. I'm ready to knock this joker out because that's my natural. That's who I am at this time in my life. I'm just defensive. I'm tired of rejection. I'm, I'm fierce. Long story short, the guards come in, they separate us, and the same guy that was in that prison cell with me, his name was Andrew Kirkman. He's doing a life sentence. Andrew puts his hand on my shoulder. He says, brother, we don't do that anymore. I looked at Andrew and I said, man, maybe you don't do that. I said, but that's how I handle business in here. 
Andrew didn't say another word. Two hours later, he comes out and he asked me to come back to his prison cell. We have to understand, I'm looking at a 1 to 2, a 12 to 24, and a 25 to 40. I've got nothing but burden on my mind, and I've got a little boy at home who I made promises to that I want to see before I have to go away and do my time. Andrew sits me down, opens up the Bible, begins to read from uh, John chapter 3, verse 3. It's where a guy named Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, and he comes at night because he doesn't want no one to see him. And he asked me if I understand that. And I said, man, I don't have a clue. He said, well, what you have to understand is, is that when you prayed your prayer earlier today, God forgave you of everything that you have ever done. Now, you, you got to understand the impact of this on a 22-year-old young man who has done a lot of stuff, and I'm very angry about it, and I'm justifying it, and now I'm understanding that everything I've ever done, I have the potential to be forgiven of it. He says, the only thing you have to do is begin to live your life responsibly for him. I said, well, you know, cool, right? I don't know the gravity of what he just said. So I'm thinking this is no problem. Here's the great thing. That night I go back to my prison cell. It's always lights out at either 10 or 11 o'clock. Andrew, the same gentleman who prayed with me, he ends up writing me a one and a half page letter. And I remember the letters were really big, Matt. And they were really big because his eyes, he couldn't really see that well. But what it was, was a letter that was telling me how to talk to God. Why is this important? It's important because I never learned how to talk to a father because I never had a father figure in my life that I could talk to. And so he's now training for the first time someone's taking me under their wing. And instead of saying, can you shoot a three point shot? Can you dunk a basketball? Can you run a football? I have nothing to offer this guy. And he's doing it altru altruistically. He's doing it out of benevolence to just help a young man who was in trouble. Here's the beauty. My prayer is, get me out so that I can just go home and see my son. I go to court a week later. They reduce all of my bonds. And I'm an interstate trafficker. They reduce all of my bonds to where I can pay to get out. I pay them. They let me out. I get on a plane. I fly home. And I get to fulfill my conversation, my embrace, and my love with my son. Here's why that's so powerful. Because that was the only thing that I had prayed for. And the prayer was answered even when we thought there was no way that that could be possible for it to happen for me. So now I've got the succession of court cases that I've got to go through. And again, just give me a look if you want to intercede or yeah. ask a question. So now I've got a one to two on a gun charge. And I get sentenced to four to 23 months on this one to two. Now, at this point in my life, I'm reading what I call my playbook, right? If you're an athlete, if you're a wide receiver, a running back, a quarterback, even an offense or a defensive lineman, you've got to study your playbook so that when the play is called, you know which play to run. So I'm studying the word of God. It's my playbook for life. And here's how it navigated me on the field of life. As I'm praying, I end up going to court. They sentence me. I get four to 23. I do the four months, but the whole time that I'm in there, I'm studying my playbook. I'm doing my sit-ups. I'm doing my push-ups. I'm working in the kitchen. Here's what's great. While I'm working in the kitchen of the jail, and I still have these two other cases that are pending, and it's a lot of time, I end up getting the job of having to sweep the floor, but I hated the correctional officer that ran the kitchen. I'm still full of attitude. I'm still this guy that will pump my fists up in the air in a, in a second if you look at me or say something incorrect. As I'm sweeping the floor, I would always cut the corners of the floor in the kitchen, and I would always push it to the middle, and I would cover the dirt up with a rug instead of scooping it up and putting it in the trash. I go back to my prison cell. I get my shower after my shift. I open up my playbook. Here's what it says to me. It says, when you work, don't work like you're working for men who see what you do, but work as though you're working for God in heaven who sees everything that you do. I fell under major conviction. This is why I want to make sure I emphasize this point. Now I'm at a place in my life where I can hear my father's voice. 
and it's correcting my behavior. And that's all I ever cried out for was a relationship where a father's voice, I would honor it enough that I would adjust and correct my life and obey what he's telling me to do because I know he loves me and he wants what's best for me. Bro, I went back to the kitchen that next morning. I swept that floor like I'd never swept it before. Let me tell you why. Because while I'm laying there in my cell, and you're only going to get this if you get this. So for those of you that are watching or listening and you think I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, I'm really not. This is just my story and this is how it played out. I laid there and while I was laying there, I felt this remorse and this sense of I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've not been working up to your par because that's the way I lived my life at this point. And he says to me, you don't want to get out of prison. And I'm laying on my jail bunk and I'm saying, yes, I do. He says, if you wanted to get out of prison, you would stop cutting corners and covering things up. He said it just like that to me. I got up that next morning, went in there, swept that floor, mopped that floor, put all that dirt in a dustpan, and that kitchen floor had never been better swept or clean than it was with me after that lesson. And what that was teaching me, bro, was you're not working for men who see you. You're working for God who, look, here's the, here's the best part of that scripture, who will reward you after you have done what he's asked you to do. And that was what I needed. I needed the reward at the end of my work. So here's the beauty of it. I get out of jail after four months. Now I got a 12 to 24. Now I've got four guys that are testifying against me that I sold them crack cocaine. I never sold any one of those four guys any crack cocaine. I didn't work the streets at all. I had soldiers who worked the streets for me. So I never touched it. I never exchanged it. I never took money for it. Four guys in the grand jury are testifying against me. Here's what I believe happened. And this is why reform is so important to at least give attention to. They were asked in the grand jury, just like I was asked in the grand jury, if I had ever, or if they knew of me ever being involved in drug transactions, and they all four said yes, because certainly they had heard of it. They took that confession of yes, that they had heard of it and put them in my case, which caused them to have to testify against me, but I knew I had never done it. So here's the case. I have a paid attorney. He tells me plead guilty to this 12 to 24 years. And if you plead guilty, we'll get it run concurrent with your 25 to 40 that you're looking to serve in another state because that's a mandatory sentence. Now, that's a paid attorney. And what I discover is not only did I not do what these four are testifying against and taking me to trial to, to, test, uh, to, to go to trial about, but now my attorney has plea bargained with the DA to send me up the river for a signature. I go home. It's the night before court, man. I have a lot of anxiety, bro. I open up and I read Luke 12, 12. Let me tell you what it says. It says, when you stand in the courtroom, do not be afraid of what you will say. For it will not be you who is speaking, but it will be God who speaks through you. I'm not cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. This is just my story. I literally read this the night before I went to court. I go to court the next day. The judge tells me to stand. We understand that we have a guilty plea from you. I stood up and I said, no, sir, your honor, not guilty. Now, the DA and my attorney look at each other like, you know, what's going on here? I look at my attorney. I say, I'm, I'm pleading not guilty. I, I never sold any drugs to these four guys. My attorney goes to the back room of the DA. Ten minutes later, they come out. My attorney says, you're not going to believe this, but they're going to null process all 12 to 24 years, which means you've been arrested, but they'll never take you to trial and you'll never do any time on those charges. Now, this is the same attorney that just told me to plea bargain the deal, but I work away with the null process. Why? Because I'm reading my playbook, I'm praying, and God is answering my prayers. So now I'm looking at what? A 25 to 40. Now, I'm in the courtroom elated about this 12 years, null process, right? Now I've got a 25 to 40, what am I gonna do? I call my attorney in the other state. He says, how'd everything go up there on your grand jury indictment? I said, man, you won't believe it, they null process. And he said, you have gotta be kidding me. 
they never know process these charges. They don't even take you to trial unless they know that they can at least get some conviction out of it. He says, give me 10 minutes, I'll call you back. I call him back in 10 minutes, Matt. He says, you won't believe this, but because you don't have a prior conviction on drug charges, this state can no longer view you as a mitigated felon. They have to view you as a first time offender. And in this state, for the amount of cocaine that you had as a first time offender, the max is not 25 to 40. The max is a mandatory seven years in prison. Come on, man. 38 down to seven. Because my life changed because somebody cared enough to pray for me on the floor of a prison, bro. And as I got into the word and as another man began to disciple me, didn't matter what color they were. I had a white guy that handed me a Bible. I had a black guy that wrote a prayer for me. We as a unit began seeing my life change. Now I'm down to a seven. I give my son a kiss and a hug. I say, listen, daddy's going away for seven years. But when I come back, I'm going to be the best father I can be for you. I go and I stand in on that seven years, Matt. Listen to this. While I was in jail, I was complaining. Instead of praying, I was complaining. And I said, these jails are overcrowded. They're filthy. They're Latin, uh, nasty. They stink. These guys that are in this cell with me don't brush their teeth. They don't wash their, you know, their bodies. They're nasty. When I get sentenced to the prison, I stand in on the seven and my uh, counselor calls me down and says, well, we understand that you've got a mandatory seven years, but I've got some news I need to share with you. I said, yes, ma'am. What is it? She says, well, we've had some problem with the prison being overcrowded. I said, yeah, I know. I just sat in jail with some guys that smelled like funk. She says, and because of the overcrowding, your mandatory seven is being cut to three and a half immediately. What's the moral to the story? The very thing that I was complaining about instead of praying about is what God used to cut my time in half, bro. That's why I have learned and I have to continue to remind myself no matter what is happening, it's all going to work out in the end for my good. And I've got to remember that. And I've got to you know, tell myself that. Long story short, when I went into prison, I started doing, uh, they had trade school where I was. Well, I didn't want to lay bricks and I didn't want to learn how to do electrical wiring, but they also had a computer class. I took the computer course, changed my life, gave me confidence, gave me the, the ability to know when I get out of here, I've got some type of a skill that I can go and interview for. I then took correspondence courses at UNC Chapel Hill. I then shifted five different prisons to get where their professors would come in and teach classes at the facility. I had a 4.0 GPA with every one of their professors. I then uh, I registered so that I could go to the UNC campus for day study so that even though I'm incarcerated, they were releasing me to go to college campus to take my courses and to come back. UNC Chapel Hill wouldn't let me on their campus because I was a convicted felon. But North Carolina Central University, which was an HBCU, Historical Black College University, said we would love to have you. And so I ended up taking 12 credit hours while I was incarcerated at North Carolina Central University. Uh, ended up, once I got out of prison, transferring to Howard University in Washington, D.C., and I was reunited on weekends, being able to go back and forth and see my son. Just spoke to my son today. He's in Los Angeles, California. I love him with everything I've got. Doesn't mean I haven't struggled to be the best father I can be. Doesn't mean I've done everything right. But I'm still here. I'm still willing to be better. And I love my son today even more than I loved him back then when I was going away to do this prison time. So I appreciate you giving me that window of time to share some of my story. First of all, it's your show. I'm just a facilitator, so I'm glad you had had enough um, enough of a role there to really get that out. And you did. It was an amazing story. I one thing that I you know I'm listening to that whole thing and and I, I'm hearing how all these miracles were happening for you. Yeah. Um, throughout, throughout this process for you, and when you got out of prison, how old was your son? When I got out, my son was five. Now, when you were, from the time that you went away until the time you got out of prison, was he allowed to come visit you? I was seven states away. 
So I did all of my prison time far enough away. When I was in the county jail, when I initially got locked up, now you have to understand, uh, and, and this, this goes to really what my heart is and why I'm looking at reform too, Matt. You know, my relationship with his mother had fallen apart. Uh, I wasn't a very good boyfriend to her. She deservingly left me while I was going through this crisis. So she wasn't bringing my son. But I remember one day getting the call that my mother was there for a visit. And I came down from my jail cell. And as I turned the corner, I was smiling to see my mother sitting there. But she was holding my little boy. And I never wanted my little boy to see me like that. And I remember him reaching up and wanting to touch me, but he couldn't because there was glass in between us. And I remember putting my hand up next to his and all I could do was tell him, I love you. I, I love you, son. I know you don't understand this. My son today doesn't even remember it. But you can tell that it still provokes emotion in me. And I would much rather Matt cry about it than be hardened about it because I know what it is to be hardened and unemotional and uncaring. But when you really care about someone, you're not afraid to be emotional with them. So I just, I, I am just so grateful that God has done these things in my life. He's taught me so many amazing lessons. And I believe that my relationship with all of my children, uh, my son is now 30. Uh, his older sister was a daughter to me during the time that I was with them, I had another young girl uh, in Miami, Florida, who did not know her father. And so I love the privilege of being able to play a father role for her uh, there. And now I have a five-year-old who doesn't know her daddy. And she just lights up my world. And these, these girls, uh, I, I think it's because I was hurt so badly wanting the love of a father growing up that it gives me this overwhelming willingness to be as good of a father as I can be for these four children and encouraging other men to do the same as well. Night, just to give more context, I, I didn't know that story. Um, I asked that question because I was curious to know, yeah, you watch TV and I, I mean, I've been a cop for 26 years and I've put a lot of people in prison, um, but I, I wanted to know from somebody who was having such a struggle with the the separation from your son and the age that he was, whether or not there was any moments where you had a chance to see him and what that I wanted to hear. And I didn't even know that that was the impact, but I wanted to hear you go back to that moment where you had a moment where he was there and you got to visit him. And I'm glad you shared that with me. And I, I really do appreciate that because I, you know, I, I, I never told you this story, but, um, I went through a 13 year period of depression after my brother was killed mm -hmm. and I was emotionally devoid of love. I couldn't love anything. I couldn't love my wife um, the way she needed to be loved. I, I had a child and I couldn't love her, my oldest daughter, Rebecca. Um, and I've, I struggled with that mightily. Um, and it's my, my biggest um, disappointment for myself was that I couldn't do that to a child, a newborn child that needed me. I knew yeah. I could be there physically. I could protect her. I could do all the, 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 the dad things physically, but I couldn't emotionally give yeah. her what she needed. And, yeah. and I've spent the rest of my life trying to change that in her. And, and, you know, obviously I have a great relationship with my daughter and she's amazing. And, um, but I just wanted to know, I kind of sensed, um, that there was something behind that. And, and I appreciate you sharing that your yeah. son, when you got out, have you had conversations with him about that time period, like the, the, to keep it as clear and, and open and, and transparent as possible for, for his first five years of his life? 
Yeah, I, I, I think it's hard, again, and I, I want to put all of this in the context for both you and anybody who may get a hold of this, that because of all these other dynamics that are at play, it's really difficult because I am so grateful and so thankful to my son's mother. She played an absolute incredible role in his life and still does to this very moment. She's just an incredible mother. They have an incredible bond one with another. Um, but so it's hard for me to talk with my son about the dynamics of our relationship back then without hurting him as mm -hmm. it relates to his mother because of our dysfunction. Now, accepting my role in it is, is key. Um, so I just think that it's hard, again, for fathers who have taken any time lapse away from their children to come back in and try to explain it to them is typically not going to be fair in many cases. The beauty of it for me was, was that uh, his mother and myself, we determined very early in me getting out of prison that we had to put our son above ourselves. And so because of our common love for him, her and I were able to have a very amicable, honest, uh, caring relationship. Um, now, she was in other relationships by that time. What was hard for me, and this is one of the truths that I had to share with him, the whole time that I was in prison, I was praying and believing that I was getting prepared to come out and regain my family back. And so when I got out and she had moved on and was in another relationship, I was confronted with the reality now that she had moved on without me and that I was going to have to accept that and continue to love her even in the face of being broken because I was. And I had to learn how to love him and his sister as well. So again, these are dynamics. Mm -hmm. Now think for me, if I would have made the decision to go back and live in that same town, that's the town that I got in all the trouble in. My name had a, had a target on it be, because everybody thought that I, well, most of the officials thought that I was really a, a, a jerk of a guy by the time that I, you know, I graduated from the athletic piece. So they all knew me for athletics. But when I got involved in the trafficking, they just thought, and I probably was, not a very good guy. So I've got a target back there. So I elect to live in the D.C. area and make the commute back and forth on weekends as often as I could, just so that I could spend the day and a half with my children before I had to drive back home and go to work when I got back to D.C. So a lot of things that play there, but, you know, it's what has shaped us. This is why I, I really am a fighter for once a guy gets out of prison, if he wants to win he should be given the opportunity to win. And I had to face things like not being able to get an apartment in my own name, not being able to get hired at a corporation. So everybody would tell me, why don't you go get a job shoveling dirt or shoveling mud? Now I, I just, I have a 4.0 GPA all through a four year university. Like I, my capacity is much greater than what you're telling me what I need to go and do. And all I was praying for was give me an opportunity uh, to work at my capacity for some corporation. And that never happened for me. But you were, luckily, I mean, that it's a good transition point, I think. Um, first of all, I, I do want to say thank you for sharing um, what obviously was a painful moment. Um, because I think it's, it's important that people see um, when you're out in the public, like we are speakers, when you are doing interviews, when you're, you're going to schools and you're, you're going into prisons, it's, People can sense bullshit from a mile away. Yeah. They can sense when you're not being authentic. They can sense when it's a, a, a prepared shtick. And this show, by its very nature, is unprepared. Yeah. And and I, I thank you for, for just being in that moment and sharing that. Um, you mentioned not having the opportunities to, to, to work at your capacity. You were, though, however, and I don't know if this was through prayer or... Um, luck or being in the right place at the right time, you were put into a position where you were able to use your capacity on some level working as a as a bodyguard for some some pretty important people. 
Yeah, so here's what's really funny. So the, the job that I did get was working at a what's called a mega church in Washington, D.C. And I loved it because my role there was going into the inner city and gathering up, you know, boys and girls to do sports camps and then introducing them to faith, which I absolutely love. But while I was there, the leader of the church decided that we were no longer going to do things that cost us money. We were only going to do things that made money. And I didn't agree with that. And I still don't agree with that. I think there's a reason why churches are nonprofits. And I think there's a service that it's supposed to provide to the community in terms of outreach and doing more than a Sunday morning service. So with that being said, I've got a lot of issues with today's church, just as Jesus did, according to Revelation chapter two and three. So anybody who's listening, go read that because Jesus has an issue with the church today. Anyway, long story short, I end up leaving working at the church in D.C. because 9-11 takes place in New York City. So I work with a buddy of mine up there who gave me an opportunity to come and do uh, some of the relief work. We had a couple of million dollars that were given uh, to a church organization up there. And what was interesting it was that I had the role of interviewing these people that were going through terrible crisis. And what disheartened me was... I had people that needed things because they lost their fathers, they lost their mothers, they lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they had no income, they had mortgages that were due, they had rent, they were getting ready to get kicked out of their home because of, and I was told to take applications on them and we'd make a decision in the next three months. And I thought that's, that's just not satisfactory. So with that being said, I left very disenchanted with the faith world, not with God, I argued with him. We, we had some conversations, but it was with the way the church was, uh, was, was acting here on the earth. And so I ended up going to Miami, interviewed with a number of corporations through a temp agency, got into fourth and fifth interviews, but it would always end up with me being sat down and asked the question, we see that you have some felony convictions on your application. Can you tell us about those? And by the time I told them I had a gun charge and a trafficking cocaine charge, they said, we're sorry, we can't hire you. So I remember my older brother looking at me and he said, bro, whether they hire you or not, you've got to do something. He said, you need to go down to South Beach and you need to find a job in a club. And I thought, this is like so beneath me, right? Like, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I go to South Beach. I find the hottest club on South Beach. I started working in that club. And while I'm working there, we get word that Jennifer Lopez is coming that night. So her advance guy comes into the club. I meet him, connect with him. We start kicking it back and forth. Matter of fact, he looks a lot like you, by the way, Matt. We start kicking it back and forth. I give him my card and I say, listen, if you ever need any help, just give me a call and let me know. Walked away. Jennifer did not come that night which was disappointing and that we find out that that was the night that her and Ben Affleck had their breakup deal. And here's the beauty of it. Their breakup turned into my opportunity because the next day I get a call from this guy and he says, can you be to Jennifer's house in an hour? I need you to work for us. I said, brother, I'll be there in 30 minutes. What are you talking about? I'm on the way. So I started working with her, got the opportunity to fly on private jet planes to Spain, South America, Central America. She later would marry Mark Anthony. I got to travel with him as well, who's a, a dynamic singer. I was working with Puff Daddy uh, in Miami, Florida. I was his personal driver in Miami for five years. And so I got to just experience life at the height of what that looks like and feels like. I got to stay in the most amazing hotels in Barcelona, Madrid, uh, Alicante, Benidorm, off the coast of Morocco, the Canary Islands, just incredible. Now here, to put this in context, 10 years earlier, I'm sitting on the bunk of a jail bed looking at 38 years in prison and a man came and prayed for me and another man taught me how to pray and I started reading my playbook and 10 years later, bro, I'm in Barcelona in the Ritz Carlton in the penthouse and my life has changed drastically. 
And it was incredible. But I remember it was at the height of that. I was with Puffy at the VMA Awards in Miami, 2007, I think it was. I'm his driver. We pull out of his house. He's got a 14, 15. I think it's an $18 million house now is what it's valued at. I've got 10 police on motorcycles in front of me. I've got 10 police and cop cars behind me. Miami Dade is my escort, my convoy. We're coming across the water, bro. There's Apache helicopters with video cameras hanging off of the side, recording us live on MTV as we come across the water. Palm trees dancing in the breeze. Music turned all the way up. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine. Salt and pepper and heavy D up in my limousine. Little biggie. Bro, we ended up getting off the exit, pulling into the Miami Airlines arena. Puff has 100 people that come and rush him inside. I back his $350,000 Rolls Royce up. And while I'm sitting in the front seat of that expensive car, the same voice that spoke to me in a jail cell spoke to me in the front of a $350,000 Rolls Royce. Here's what it said. You're not doing what I created you to do. I told you, go and tell people what I have done for you. Let me tell you why this is important. I never shared what I had been through because every time I did, it never worked to my advantage. It always worked to me being rejected. So it was a big deal for me now to hear I got to go out here and get rejected again by telling my story. I ended up with Stevie Baldwin. He's an actor. He's one of the Baldwin boys. Me and him got cool. We met at Puffy's house during a New Year's Eve party. I traveled around the country, ended up in L.A. with him. And some guys told me they were getting ready to go into the prison to speak. I said, yo, I want to go. They said, well, you got to go here and do this and that. And I said, OK, cool. I flew back to Miami. Three weeks later, I think it was, I fly to Oakland, California. The first prison that I speak in is San Quentin. One of the meanest, roughest prisons historically in the country. I step onto the prison yard. There's 3,500 inmates. Probably about 1,000 of them are listening to me. As I share my story, Matt, I watch men come weeping and crying and broken because of the honesty in my message. It wasn't boxed, it wasn't packaged, it wasn't anything that I was doing to give them height. It was just the realness and rawness of how God impacted my life, changed me, and now look at what he's doing with my life. And I knew from that day forward, man, my life was going to be changed by me sharing what God had done for me. So I, I've, I've traveled with an organization I've spoken in over 250 prisons across the United States. I've spoken in many colleges. Um, I've spoken in schools. Um, but now I'm in the last phase of life. And this last phase is this. I've got all of this credibility behind me. Now I want to approach it from the top and no longer from the bottom. And that's why I'm trying to reach the reform guys. I'm trying to reach the Michael Rubens. I'm trying to reach the Reform Alliance organization. I'm trying to reach anybody who is doing it from the top down so that I can take this experience and I can lend credibility to it. Listen, a lot of people have made reform a, a black thing. It's not a black thing. It's an evil thing. And it's something that has to be changed because it's systemic. It is racist, but it's impacting and affecting more than just black families. It's affecting all families because it's removing men and women from their homes so their children are being raised without ever knowing their parents. And that's just something that I feel very passionately about, obviously, because of my story. So, yeah, it was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine, salt and pepper and heavy D up in my limousine. I love, love, I love some Biggie. God bless him. God bless him. Rest in peace. So, now we're on the reform topic. And obviously, as a police officer, um, I have opinions on it. I'm, but I'm, but I'm not probably not what you're thinking. I, I am. Um, maybe if you would ask me 26 years ago, I'd have a different opinion. But I do believe that there is um, there's something that needs to be done because the recidivism is just too high. But I think that it's a it's probably a multi prong attack. You know, from my, my background in the military, looking at this from. From, you know, we're going to go air, we're going to come in from land, we're going to do everything, right? So not only do we need to have people like you who can speak the language, who can speak from a from place of 
of, of um, credibility where they go, he's been where I'm at and now we'll look at what he's doing and how did he get there? But then there also has to be a component where um, law enforcement needs to get involved. Um, the church needs to get involved. There has to be the most vital component to all of this is there has to be some acknowledgement and some accountability and responsibility on the prisoners. And Absolutely. Like there just has to be, you don't you don't become Dutch Bradley had you not asked for forgiveness. Yeah. And allowed it to happen inside of you. Absolutely. And it's so easy during that time when you were struggling after you got out to find work, to find housing, to find all those things. The fact is, is that nobody wants to rent or hire convicts because quite frankly, you were convicts. Yeah. And you did did stuff that was not jiving with what they want to hire. Yeah. But, and that's a big but, there should be a pathway back to credibility in, in society for people that are willing to go through what you went through. Because it shouldn't be, I get out of prison tomorrow, I work for IBM. It should be, I get out of prison, I go through the process that you went through. I show that I'm willing. Listen, guys that didn't go to prison had trouble getting jobs. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? They're, they're, the world is not fair. But if everybody is willing to put in the work, it is not easy to be successful. It is not easy to go out and work your ass off and not get paid what you're worth. But at some point in time, if you believe in your talent and your own ability, you're going to achieve based on your own belief system, beyond your, your own merit, your own accountability chart that you have within yourself that allows you to go out and look in the mirror and say, today was a good day. I gave it all I had. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, you end up where you're supposed to be. I don't, I don't think there's anything random in this world. I don't believe that my brother's death was random. I don't believe that my 13 year period of darkness after that was random. I don't think what I went through was, woe was me. It was, thank you, God, for allowing me to make it through that period that I needed to go through in order to have the grace bestowed upon me that allowed me to become the man I am today. If I hadn't had that struggle, I wouldn't be me. Had you not made the choices you made after high school and had that moment on the floor of that prison given to you, where someone prayed for you, yeah, and a Bible handed to you and a prayer written for you, you would not be who you are today. Yeah, nothing right. Those are real things. Yeah. Yeah, you may be surprised, but I agree with everything you just said. The thing is, we've got to get the system to what you just described, and it's not there. Right now, it's, it's, it's a no based on what you did 10 years ago. It's a no based on what you did 20 years ago. I mean, listen, I've been out of prison for a while now. I still get rejected when I put in applications for where I want to live because somebody has the right, first of all, to know that I'm a convicted felon and second, to not rent or lease their home or their property to me. So that's a difficult thing because I've got a track record of doing good. I mean, I've got a long track record. This isn't anything that's new. I've got a long track record, but I still have had to sit in the face of six rejections because nobody wanted me to live in their home. And that's that's a real thing. Oh, no doubt. And and I think uh, you know, at some point in time, um, you know, I can't. I didn't go to college. I got offered a job when I was getting out of the air marshals. I applied for a job of head of security for the Sarasota County School District. Oh wow. And I was offered the job. They were flying me down to meet with the school board. And the week before I got, I, they were sending me my plane tickets. They said, all we need is your college transcript. <laughs> yeah. I said, I, I don't have a college transcript. Yeah. They said, oh, we thought we just misplaced it. Or I said, no, I didn't go to college. They said, well, unfortunately, you're not qualified for this job then. I said, well, five minutes ago, I was your number one choice. Exactly. Exactly. Because I don't have a degree in basket weaving or something stupid that could have been a four-year degree, I'm not qualified for this job. So I get it. I understand where where your your choices you make. I made a choice not to go to the United States Coast Guard Academy yeah. and enlist in the Army. And that choice kept me from getting a job at the Sarasota County School District. Yeah. 
and that's going to live with me for the rest of my life. But it's not a defining moment. It's just the fact that sometimes our choices suck and our choices have long term effects on us. This, this may not surprise you. I don't think it will. Not only does there need to be prison reform, but there needs to be military reform. My son just finished eight years in the United States Navy. And let me tell you, it's tough on these guys when they get out. And there's a group down here in Dallas, Texas called 22 Kill. 22 men a day commit suicide post-military yep. service. And so there's a lot of reform that needs to take place for a lot of people. And, you know, my thing is just to do my part. If I can impact those that will hear me, uh, that's my goal. I can't change the world, but I can change the world around me. And so that's that's my Amen effort. That. Yeah. Well, I, I love you. I'm a fan. Um, I'm going to support you and however I can support you. If you need uh, my help in any way that I can help, I'm there for you. Um, you know, we got to wrap this thing up. I could probably do this for another hour. Man, um, I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you. And, I, and I'm thankful you came on. I'm thankful you shared your story. I'm thankful people got to hear it. Um, I'm, we're going to wrap this up. Don't go anywhere. We're going to stay on video after we close down here. Um, but everybody, thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we kept a strong listening audience tonight. Um, it was steady the entire night. Um, I appreciate you. appreciate your um, support of the show. Um, and so once again, this was another episode of the Two Dates in the Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler. Thank you to my special guest, Dutch Bradley. And for God's sakes, everybody, go out there, do something amazing tomorrow, and be kind to one another. God bless. Godspeed.